Okay, so we continue with the fifth part, dynamic programming and the algebraic structures that allow us to generalize dynamic programming. So, so dynamic programming in a certain perspective is basically an approach to find us the best solution, the top one solution for an optimization problem. To illustrate, let's look at the binary join. Assume we have a join between R and S, both tables join here on also y second attribute of r first attribute of s and let's assume here we have a cross product now what we now do is we add now weights to each tuple think about weights as something like costs something you try to avoid and what the following query does it tries to find the lightest joining pair so we sum up the weight from the r tuple and the s tuple of those tuples that join, we order by increasing some of the weights and we want to find the top one. So this problem is basically a shortest path problem. You could imagine we add here a source and a target or terminal and we want to find a path from S via some tuple in R and some tuple in S that join to T. The answer of this query over this particular parameterized database instance is first of all we get that an intermediate result size of n to the power of two quadratic number of possible results but we are interested really only in the lightest pair the one with the smallest weight but the problem is that a typical database system postgresql first calculates all of the quadratic many possible paths from s to t only then sorts them and finds the smallest one. You can verify this via the following instance. Um, you go to this website, uh, you look for database number 606. We have here exactly this database. As we increase the size of the database by a factor of 10 and we time it, we see the database needs 100 times as, um, as long to find the top joining tuple. If we now slightly modify the query, so we help the database, we basically um, give it a certain sequence of operations it should perform, then this 22 seconds go down to 4 milliseconds. And the key intuition what's going on is that the way we create this query, we write this query, we guarantee that the maximal intermediate result size at each of the steps is linear. And it's basically dynamic programming that we are we're doing here. And the same also applies if you only want to have the top one value. Yeah? So the top one value, in this case, it's just two. You have the same problem. The database scales quadratically. So in, in another way to, to, to see here is this, what we would like to do is we want to find the top one result. We also call this time to first, because we want to think about time to first, time to last, or time to k and a number database first creates all of the individual tuples and then sorts them well we are interested to find the smallest one can we somehow avoid calculating all of the intermediate results in order to just get the top one so this is what dynamic programming does and dynamic programming, you may have learned in different classes um, with two slightly different definitions that capture the same underlying idea. The original idea of dynamic programming comes from optimization. And here's a definition, slightly rewritten. I'll let you read this. So the idea of this definition is the following. If we have an optimal solution, the shortest path from S to T, in this case, it's we have three and two, five. Then any sub problem, namely how do we get from M to T, needs to also use some subset of the solution from the bigger solution. Whenever we have this property, this allows us to bottom up calculate the optimal solution. We first find the optimal solution to go from T to M, and then we find the optimal solution to go from S to M. So it's a bottom-up 
step you may often heard bottom up you go from the end to the beginning the underlying equation is called the bellman equation the equation states the following if we want to find the optimal solution start here, the optimal solution at a particular state i so for example here the state i what we then take is we find the minimal of the sum over all of the possible states that can be reached and their optimal solution together with the cost that we have to pay to um, to transition from our current state to that state and if we now bottom up calculate this from our target step by step by step by step by step we are guaranteed to find the optimal solution for the minimal path from s to t a slightly different definition, more general, is the following. Whenever we break a complicated problem into simpler sub-problems and then can solve them recursively bottom-up. It's a slightly more general definition. So let's look at four examples together. The first example, what is the shortest path from S to T? And what is the shortest? Think about all of those numbers here as weights or costs. So that's something you have to pay. If you want to cross a bridge from S to M, you have three options. This is the most expensive one. Well, the shortest path, the minimal cost, can be achieved by crossing this bridge first and then that bridge. Three plus two is five. And how actually would we calculate this intuitively? We have 12 possible paths. So here was probably if you've solved this, the, the, the calculations you've probably performed is to say, hmm, what is the minimal path from M to T? And what is the minimal path from S to M? So instead of calculating explicitly all of the paths, the 12, 3 plus 2, 3 plus 4, 3 plus 7, so 12 possible paths, we first say, what is the minimal in the first part and the minimal in the second one, and then we add them up. So the way we would calculate this is basically just to apply the distributivity law. It turns out the plus operator distributes over the minimum. If you find the minimum from S to M and then add something, then the minimum for the subproblem is still the, uh, uh, this particular path also tells us which path we have to take for the total longer path. Second example, um, similar almost. Um, how many paths are there from S to T? We've already discussed it, right? So we have three here and four here. So intuitively, we just have to multiply them and we get 12. So what have we really done intuitively? Well, intuitively, we have said, hmm, if we want to calculate all of the possible paths and we add them up, yeah, so we add the toss of possible paths. Instead, we add up the paths that are from S to M, and there are three, and we multiply them by summing up the different paths from M to T. And again, like before, what we applied here is the distributivity law, and this may be more familiar, this form of distributivity. Multiplication distributes over addition. X plus Y times z is the same as x times z plus y times z. Let's look at a third example. The, assume I give you an array, a list of numbers, and you want to find the longest increasing subsequence. So what is an increasing subsequence? Well, the subsequence such that if you hop from one to the next, the numbers must increase. So we could not hop from 3 to 2, but we can hop from 3 to 4, or even from 3 to 7. How could we solve this and find the longest increasing subsequence? Well, we can use dynamic programming. So let's give these numbers some node index, and then let's look at all the possible permissible transitions. So we add edges for all of those hops that are allowed. We can hop from 1 to 3 because it's increasing. We cannot go from 3 to 2. And now, bottom up from the right side, we see 
how many, what is the best possible extension of that particular state? So for example, in this bottom up phase, assume we are at number four. At four, we can hop to seven, to eight, to five, to six, to all of them. And if you've already calculated how many hops are there from each of those states, here's, we have one, here we have two, one, two. So we now can compare those and determine that the best we can do here, if we come to this one, then we have four. Ah, so then we have three, because one, two, three is one of those two possible so solutions. So the DP formulation here on the left side is four from the right side to the left, step by step, find the maximal over all of the ways we can extend our particular state with one additional transition. So for four, we can go to seven, to eight, to five, to six. For each of them, we get uh, one more. And for each of them, we add how many more we can do here. So here we can do two, here we can do two, here we could do one. Now, challenge question, could we formulate this as a shortest path problem. So yeah, we can by doing the following. Let's give a weight of minus one to each of those edges. Intuitively, we want to write the shortest one, so we just make minus. We could also calculate as the longest path, but let's be consistent. So therefore, w minus one for each of those transitions. We add a source node. And we add edges from the source to each of those states. Intuitively, if you go here, well, we have one sequence. And then we have a final path to the target. And we give this a weight 0. Now we can reformulate the same as the shortest path problem by saying is, again, from the right side to the left, find the distance that minimizes the current um, the, the, the additional weight we go, we have for going to, to this additional state. In this case, for all of those ones here, it's minus one, for this is uh, plus one, over all of the reachable state from that position. And then at the end, we do minus of that number. And in this case, we get, for example, as a one example solution, we would get five as the longest sequence. One, two, three, four, five. Let's look at the fourth problem, Fibonacci numbers. The Fibonacci numbers are defined as follows. Zero is zero, one is one, and every additional one is now the sum of the previous ones. So we cal calculate the Fibonacci numbers recursively uh, by this formulation, which is basically a dynamic plumbing formulation. Now, and then we get these numbers. Now, challenge question, could we formulate this as a path counting problem? So let's see. Let's give weight to all of those edges of one. Let's add a source node with two connections to the first one, to the first the first Fibonacci number zero and one. We give a weight zero to the first one and the weight one to F one. That's our initialization. And then we say our target is the one that we want to have here, Fibonacci number seven. Now we can calculate Fibonacci number seven as a path counting problem because what we do is here recursively, we add up the sum of the weights on those edges times the paths that we have for the previous two that we add up. And the key is here that the first one here was set with zero. So intuitively, it's the same as saying, how many paths are there, if you remove these nodes, from T, F7, back to S. So let's look now again at a modification of Yanakakis. 
with this in mind. For this first, we're gonna generalize a little bit dynamic programming to a particular instance of what's also called sometimes non-sealed dynamic programming, or we will call this 3DP. So what we're now gonna just assume is that we don't just have one source and one target, but we have multiple targets. And we have certain stages. And in each of those stages, we may have different states. So what we try to find here is we try to find a tree pattern such that we can reach S to T to each of the, the different three targets. This has variously also pref um, referred to as a diverging branch structure in one of the early books on non-sale dynamic programming. We will next look at Yanakakis and create a variant of dynamic programming. For this, we need to slightly generalize dynamic programming to one particular instance of non-serial dynamic programming. The idea is the way we have seen dynamic programming so far was serial, we've reasoned in a sequence of states. Now what we're gonna do is we generalize this and think we don't just have one source and one target, but we may have multiple targets we want to reach via some tree pattern. This is also variously called diverging branch structure. So let's see. Here we have our example from before, Yanakakis, a Yanakakis example. Now we're going to slightly modify the database instance. We give some weight to each of those tuples. And what we want to find is the lightest join. So this means the join result that has the minimal sum of weights weights of its tuples. And we achieve this with a slight modification of the bottom up phase of Inakakis. In a certain way, we could even say it's just a semi joint reduction that we slightly modify. So what do we do? We don't just now send, as we propagate the messages bottom up, the tuples, but we also send the minimal weights. So let's see. So we now modify our bottom up phase and don't just send B1, B2, B3. We also send B1 has five, B2 has six, B3 has seven. We send this and we both reduce the tuples in T, but we also now add those weights to the tuples that are still um, surviving the reduction. Let's continue with W. In W, notice the following. We have here two tuples with the same values. Since we care about the minimum, we only keep the one that is the, the minimum one, the minimum value. So for A1, B2, the minimum value is 2. We send these three tuples, again up to T, and add them. Two tuples have survived, and now what we know? Now we know that whatever message comes from later on in the join first top down and comes to that tuple, the total cost the minimum cost will be 19, and from that tuple, it will also be 19. So now we continue. Here, we are again in the case where we have a cross join, but the minimum we can do is, we just keep the minimum over all of those tuples. So we only care about now C1, D1, because this gives us the minimum value of one. We add this to all of those tuples, and the last part is we propagate this up, we add this up, now we pick the minimum and now we have the minimum value. So this means we have slightly modified the first bottom-up semi joint reduction of the Yanakakis algorithm to find the minimum value. If we now want to find the minimum join, we can again go top-down and find the minimum extension of that, that particular tuple. So the minimum extension is a1, B2, here we only have one choice. Here we know the value needs to be B2. So we go to the second tuple. We see it is B2. And uh, here we have also A1, B2. So what have we achieved? In linear time, 
I mean, one, basically two passes over the data, we have found the minimum value and the minimum result. Now notice the total number of possible outputables for this query is n to the power of three. This is because the fractional edge cover for this particular query is three. This means a standard relational database like PostgreSQL, they would try to find the minimum joining, um, the minimum weight join would have a possible intermediate result of n to the power of three, whereas with dynamic programming, we can solve it in linear time. So next, let's look at the abstraction behind what we have done here um, and the algebra, the algebraic structure that have allowed us to do what we have done with these various examples in the previous pages. So we first look at one binary operator or particular set, and we look at certain properties that are of interest for us. So we have a set, we have an operator, we want that if we take any elements from the set, then the outcome of the operator should also be in the set. That's called a magma. A magma is an, is an algebraic structure of a set and a binary operator, such that the operation on any two elements of that set gives us again an element of the set. If we add associativity, we get a semigroup. If we add identity, we get a monoid. And if we add an inverse, we get a group. So just to make the difference between monoid and groups by an example, if we have the integers under addition, so here we should have, let me add here, like minus one, zero, one, two, and so on. Then for any number, we have an inverse. The inverse of two, what do we have to add to two to get the neutral element? Zero, minus two. In the monoid, in the natural number, zero, one, and so on, we do not have this because minus two is not part of that set. And we can also add commutativity to either of these two structures. Now we add another property that's very important for us, and this is something that is called a total order that is translation invariant. And if we add this to a monoid, then we get a totally ordered commutative monoid. What is the property we need? It's the following. For any three elements of the set, such that x is smaller than y under the total order, we also know that if we add any element z to it, then x plus z is also smaller than y plus z. So let's look at this a little bit more in more detail what this actually means for us. So this turns out to be exactly the optimal substructure that we have seen before when we talked about dynamic programming uh, from the mathematical optimization literature. Why? Because if we know that x is better than y, it's a shorter path to go from S to M. Then we also know to find the shortest path from S to T via Z, we also take X here. This was the, the property that allows us to, to perform dynamic programming. And what is this property? Well, let's see. The minimum over X plus Z and Y plus Z is the same as the minimum of x and y plus z. So it's exactly the distributivity law. Addition distributes over the minimum operator. Or multiplication distributes over addition. So we've had only one single operator. Let's look at algebraic structures with two operators. The structure we look at as semi rings. So we have two operators called plus and semi-ring multiplication. They form some forms of monoids. The additional important property now that we have for semi-rings is that multiplication, semi-ring multiplication, distributes over semi-ring addition. An example is the tropical semi-ring. The tropical semi-ring has two operators, min and plus. The neutral element for minimum is infinite minimum of any, any number and infinite is that number for plus it's zero 
and the tropical semi-ring is exactly the example we just saw before. We know minimum x and y plus z is the same as the minimum of x plus z and y plus z. And here are two other examples and yet another example of a semi-ring. And also the Viterbi semi-ring. So here we have two equivalent algebraic perspectives of dynamic programming. The one where we said we have a totally ordered commutative monoid. And the second one, where we say we have a selective commutative dioid, which is a particular semi-ring. It's a semi-ring that we have defined before with the two additional properties that it's selective. Selective means whenever we have for the addition x plus y, then the outcome must be either x or y for all sets of elements in the set. An example is the minimum. The minimum always picks one of the two operations we give to it. It's selective and it needs to be commutative. The multiplication here. It turns out these two additional properties imply that we have a total order on the set. And therefore these two perspectives are actually identical. So let's summarize here. Dynamic programming works also on trees, not just on, on a series of states. And it can be seen also as a variant of message passing. It is often the same problem as shortest pathfinding. Semi-rings allow us to further obstruct what dynamic programming does. We have seen shortest path problems and path counting problems. And it turns out Yenakakis is actually dynamic programming. It's a tree-based form of dynamic programming on the Boolean semi-ring.